um, having this opportunity to share with you on this uh, topic this evening. Church is a sign of the kingdom. And uh, particularly looking at the passage that we've uh, been looking at, uh, that uh, Lynn read for us, uh, being salt and light. Now, I guess being salt and light is a fairly well-known uh, phrase within the Christian uh, church. If you've been coming to, ch- to church at all over your life, then you've probably heard messages on this topic. Um, sometimes it's used as a kind of a spur to people within the church to be salt and light in the community, wherever it is that you are. Because there's an awareness that sometimes we feel a little bit irrelevant here in the church, and that actually sometimes the, the real action is done in the workplace, in the families, in the leisure centres, or wherever that we spend our time. And of course, we have uh, the children's groups. You know, I am a city on a hill. I am a, a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. And it, it sounds like a great notion, doesn't it, of, uh, uh, of confidence in the gospel and of the way in which we seek to transform society. But I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel that, well, how are we really doing? If you look at the church in the UK, as most of us have lived through uh, something of a decline, it would say, we would say, in the numbers in church, but also in the moral temperature, the moral climate, if you will, uh, of our society. Uh, and so sometimes if we look at ourselves, we say, am I, really, am I really salt and light where God has placed me? Am I really making a difference? And of course, it's very hard to measure and what do you do? Kind of send a survey around to your workplace? How am I doing? Or a round robin email to your family <laughs> asking if you're really salt and light? So we're going to this evening look at the text that Jesus, uh, the words that Jesus gave us about salt and light and dig down on what did he really mean uh, and then hopefully apply it to our Monday mornings and the kind of lives that we seek to live. So I'm going to ask the question, so who are the salt and light people that Jesus is addressing? And the passage, of course, in in Matthew 5 is um, uh, part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. So chapters 5 all the way through to 7, an extended discourse by Jesus, presumably kind of the sermon notes, if you like, giving us the themes of the kind of things that Jesus was talking to a group of people and the crowds mentioned in verse 1 of Matthew 5 refer to the crowds that have been following Jesus hearing his preaching and seeing the healing that he was doing throughout Israel in fact we read that crowds came from all around the surrounding area to uh, to Jesus this was a this was the, the the only show in town if you like you know, everyone wanted to hear what Jesus was, was doing and see what he was, uh, do, um, hear what he was saying and see what he was uh, doing. And so uh, as Jesus sees the crowds, he said, I need, to, I need to teach these people. And so we read his disciples came to him. And in chapter 4, we've had uh, Peter, Andrew, James and John, designated disciples. Um, no doubt the that the rest of the, the 12 were there, but also anyone who wanted to learn what this rabbi was on about and to follow in his way. So the salt and light people are people who are disciples or a modern day expression, apprentices of Jesus. And so the kind of things that Jesus was looking at in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm not uh, putting these up to, to bamboozle you in any way, but just to show you the breadth of the kind of teaching. So learning that God loves nobodies, which is basically what the Beatitudes are about, having a right attitude to the law, handling anger, handling lust, learning to forgive, building a sustainable marriage, being generous to those who take advantage, being kind to those who hate you, giving and religious acts without being smug, Uh, accessing God's power and forgiveness in prayer, particularly the the Lord's Prayer, of course, having a healthy attitude towards your stuff and money, living without worry, staying free from unhealthy judgment, learning to receive God's power, spotting false prophets. These were the kind of topics that are in the Sermon on the Mount. You could read it for yourself if you want to go through. That's the kind of curriculum that Jesus has in mind for the salt and light people. Okay? And so... As we turn to the question, so how are we like salt? Uh, You've probably uh, 
heard messages um, about the kind of different kinds uh, of salt and, and how salt might be a metaphor for us. In that uh, day, of course, salt was a valuable commodity. Uh, uh, people were paid in salt, uh, hence the expression not worth his salt. And uh, our English word salary, S-A-L, salary, uh, you probably know, was based on that salt concept. And in fact, one of the first Roman road, roads was the salt road because it was, transport, it was transporting this very valuable commodity. And Joseph, so Jesus says to, to these peasant people who are following him, you are the salt of the earth. And of course, salt in that day was used for seasoning and for flavoring. It was used for refrigeration uh, before, obviously, around about 18th, 19th century when we had proper refrigeration. You, could, you had no way of keeping uh, food edible. But actually, Jesus doesn't explain in this passage exactly what is meant by the salt. But in, uh, in his Luke passage, this parallel passage, we read this, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit for neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. <laughs> so actually primarily salt, small doses of salt were used as fertilizer on the land. It enabled you to plow the crops more easily, uh, plow the, the soil more easily. Uh, it released uh, minerals, it uh, helped to retain water, killed weeds, uh, protected the crops. And then <laughs> manure pile. Uh, no garden centres to get manure for your roses. <laughs> uh, and so they knew the properties of manure uh, could help stuff grow. And uh, salt was put to enable the manure not to decay and ferment, but to still be valuable and useful. Now, I don't know if Jesus had a bit of a twinkle in his eye and a, a, a small smile as he says, you are the salt of the earth. And they're thinking fertilizer and manure. It's not the most flattering uh, way of uh, endearing yourself to a crowd of people, is it? <laughs> and this word earth, well, it, it could mean the soil. It can mean the land, <clears throat> land of Israel. And it can mean the whole world and so again this is an extraordinary comment that you guys who are listening to me are the salt of the earth of of, of maybe you're going to affect renewal in this whole nation so how are we like salt we're helping the good to flourish as the fertilizer did <laughs> and we're stopping decay as the salt on the manure pile <laughs> did. So how are we like light? Well, Jesus says you, and again, it's a very emphatic idea, you guys are the light of the world. We're familiar with the idea of Jesus being the light of the world from John's gospel. And indeed, there are seven I am sayings in John. I am the the bread of life, I am the door, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which includes I am the light of the world. But light is the only uh, metaphor that's not just used of Jesus, but is also used of his followers. He's saying you are the light to the world. And so light uh, symbolized in, in the Bible purity rather than filth. Uh, truth rather than error and presence of God rather than God's abandonment. So you are to be light. You are to be light in the darkness, says Jesus. You're to be a, a, a thermostat rather than a thermometer. You're to set the temperature of holiness and godliness rather than just reflect what's already going on. And of course, Jesus is anticipating 
his own death and resurrection and the pouring out of his spirit that would enable these impossible ideals to be made a reality in the lives of his hearers. But of course, both passages talk about the downside or the the ways in which these salt and light people might fail in their task. So you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, the, those who know their chemistry, of course, know that salt is a stable compound. So does Jesus not know his chemistry because he's suggesting salt can lose its saltiness? Well, it can't. <laughs> but they would get the salt from the salt marshes, which would be full of impurities, which could be leached. And so effectively, salt would be as useless. It would no, not actually t- do its task at all because of that. And that's what he's suggesting is that you're, you may be theore- theoretically the salt of the earth and the light of the world, but actually you can fail in your task. And you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven so the question comes then so how are we distinctive how are we to be distinctive how are we to be salt of the earth in our lives in our communities in our families in our workplaces are we to get a big one of these big leather bibles and place it on the edge of the desk on a monday morning or polish off the cross, you know, our necklace and wander in with that? Is that that the way it's going to happen? Is it because we don't swear or don't drink? What are the markers? And of course, Christian communities down through the centuries have had different markers of what it means to be distinctive. Some Some of them look a bit odd to us in the 21st century. And I guess we would have a difference of opinion here as to whether someone's stance on something is is a wise and godly and healthy stance or completely bonkers and no help to anyone. And uh, I can tell you, I work partly for Premier Christian Radio. We we run various news uh, uh, stories about how Christians have made a stance of this, that and the other. Some of them you think, well, that's fantastic. God bless you. And some of them, you really, really? Is that really what you've done? It's just being stupid. No no wonder people are persecuting you. I would persecute you if you did that. So how are we distinctive? And I would suggest, this is why we look to the Sermon on the Mount, we're distinctive by living as apprentices of Jesus, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing the things he did. It's not by the way we protest, particularly, or the way we take a stance, which may be necessary, but it is being apprentices of Jesus, living the Jesus life. If we live according to the Gospels, according to Jesus' teaching, we will stand out in our family, in our workplace, amongst our friends. We don't do it to promote ourselves or to be weird and look at me because I'm a Christian. (laughs) No, we're just seeking to follow the ways of Jesus. We do it humbly, graciously, lovingly, we, whether someone notices or not may, may or may not happen. Sometimes we may need to say something, sometimes we won't. We'll be a prayerful presence wherever we happen to be. Seeking to love others as Christ has loved us. And so, if we're able to handle, under, handle anger and lust and learn to forgive and generous to those who take advantage and kind to those who hate us, and to give but both the way we give and also our religious acts without being smug and access God's power and forgiveness, that's going to make us stand out, is it not? <laughs> so how are we to be visible? How are we to be light in our communities? How are we to be light at work, at school, 
at college? Well, by living as apprentices of Jesus, being with Jesus, you get the picture, becoming like Jesus and doing the things he did. This will make us visible, won't it? If we live according to the Gospels, we will stand out. We will be visible. People will notice. And so I don't think we need to beat ourselves up about our impact. If, if we're being apprentices of Jesus, if we're doing the things that Jesus encourages us to do, spending time with him, praying, reading his word, maybe fasting at times, doing the practices of Jesus we've often looked at, then that's going to lead to that inner transformation. The Holy Spirit will do his work. And we will be noticed as being different because God's glory will shine through us. We will spot things and we will walk into them because we'll realize that that's what God has for us. And other times we'll keep, we'll keep quiet because it's the time to keep quiet. Because the Holy Spirit will be guiding us where we are so that we can be the right kind of light and the right kind of salt where we have been placed. And it's difficult for me to make a judgment on your life as you would make on mine. But I would trust the Holy Spirit will help you, as I trust he helps me, to know what that looks like, where we happen to be. And so some are called in particular ways. Uh, you'll perhaps be aware of the way in which street pastors have grown up in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, I don't know if you heard the stats that um, the crime rates in certain London boroughs, because street pastors are, are at work, and if you know, don't know what street pastors is, they're basically folk who spend time, particularly late evening, early morning, uh, in the, around the areas of a city or town, particularly where nightlife takes place. 30% uh, reduction in Lewisham over 13 weeks, 95% reduction in Camberwell, 74% reduction in Peckham, 7.5% uh, reduction in Lincoln. Maybe it's a bit of a more modest area there. Um, but, you know, we don't know for sure that this is because street pastors are there, but over the time and over these areas, and the police noticing it would suggest that Christian's presence is enabling good to flourish and is challenging the moral decay that exists. Now, there are many, many other examples of how Christians in a community have been salt and have been light, as well as individuals, of course. So what about tomorrow, <laughs> as I close? Well, you and I need to be where we are, showing up, praying, loving, caring, seeking opportunities. 1 Peter 3, 15, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So have I clearly established my identity? Am I an apprentice of Jesus? I'm not, not have I got there, not am I perfect, but am I plugging away, seeking to deal with stuff that's not so good and seeking to enhance God's glory in my life? Is obedience to Jesus my priority? Who am I serving? We know in our workplace that uh, we effectively are offering service to others and uh, the, we are rewarded by uh, our pay packet, our salary, and the, the rarer our service, <laughs> the higher the pay packet typically. Okay. But, but over and beyond that kind of service, who are we serving? Who are we seeking to be Jesus to? Fourthly, do I need to get out more? Is our, my problem actually that, that I'm, I'm not distinctive? I am distinctive, but I just don't connect with anyone. <laughs> and so that's a challenge to us. If all our time is spent in a Christian community, when actually the light needs to be shining in other places. And then fifthly and finally, am I listening and am I speaking? This talk about being distinctive is you know a fraught topic in a cancel culture where people are being cancelled because they believe this, that and the other. And it's very tricky in our modern era where ethical values, particularly on sexual ethics, are so very different than they used to be. 
and wading in with our particular view and that view or whatever can get very, very tricky. And it would take a whole um, series of seminars to even unpack it. But I think a lot of our work is not seeking to speak, but seeking to listen first. Maybe not having to say something, quotes Christian, but listening to the views of others. And then looking for the opportunity to put in a word that hopefully reflects something of God's love for them and of God's purposes for them, God helping them. So let's just pray together, shall we, as I wrap this up. Let's hear the words of Jesus. To us personally, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And just imagine where you are, where you'll be tomorrow morning, or where you typically would be maybe if you're working at school or in retirement, the people that you connect with. And hear those words of Jesus and, and how delighted he is that you are where you are. And that he's placed his spirit within you. And he's going to shine through you where you are. And if you're open to him, he'll give you opportunities. Not to be odd or weird, but just to love others and to care for them. And to be that salt and light, enhancing the good, preventing decay, and showing God's love and light and truth and presence. So feel God smile upon you and relax into tomorrow. Thank you, Lord.